Hey, welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the podcast that goes deeper into segments and topics that originally aired on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. This, 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 this is what you got to think about this podcast, all right? You ever be a little hangry, all right? You go to the snack machine, and then you put a dollar bill in that vending machine, and you push that button B27, and them hot Cheetos start, that, that little thing, that thing, and then them Cheetos fall down, and then two bags of Cheetos come out the vending machine. Now you got an extra snack and you got extra hot Cheeto dust on your fingers and you didn't even have to shake the damn vending machine. That's what this podcast is. I'm Roy Wood Jr. Today we're talking about a topic that has come up quite a bit on the show, transracial adoption and the experience of being raised by adoptive parents of a different race. Trevor has covered this issue and interviewed my next two guests on the show. So I'm excited to welcome them back to the Daily Show universe and have a more in-depth conversation with them about their first-hand experience. First up, I'd like to welcome the author of the book, All You Can Ever Know, Nicole Chung. Nicole, how you doing? I'm okay, Roy. Thank you for having me here. I'm sorry for getting a little excited about Cheetos. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's it's snack. totally understandable. <laughs> that was great. Also joining us uh, on the program is the author of Surviving the White Gaze, Rebecca Carroll. Rebecca, good day to you as well. And to you, Roy. Thanks so much for having me. And hey, Nicole, it's great to see you always. Always lovely to see you too, Rebecca. Now, for those of you listening and watching who were not familiar with these two wonderful people's stories, now, the both of you were adopted and raised by white parents. Nicole, we'll start with you. T tell us about your experience growing up in a transracial household and what were some of the challenges you faced growing up in a predominantly white town? Sure. So I grew up in a very small community in Southern Oregon. Um, I usually tell people it's like not the part of Oregon you've heard of, which is Portland. Um, and it, we were very far from like major urban centers. It was an extremely white area. Like I was probably the only Asian kid at my elementary school, just to give you a sense. And I did not meet another Korean American uh, or become close to them until after I left home. So it was kind of this extreme racial isolation. I grew up in a really loving family, um, loving white working class family. And, you know, I think until I started school, right, I was like aware of being different, of being Asian, not like the rest of my family. Um, I had words like Asian and Korean. Uh, I knew my birth parents had been immigrants to this country when I was born and then placed. But um, it wasn't something I thought about much in my day-to-day -day life, you know? And it wasn't until I started going out into the world, out to school, you know, seeing, hey, like I'm really the only person like me in these rooms, um, you know, that I really began to feel like, um, uh, sort of out of place. And then, you know, with school came experiences of racism. Like I started hearing anti-Asian slurs um, and being bullied by that at a fairly young age, like seven, eight years old. And again, the, the complication of this, right, is that I had been raised by really well-meaning, loving white people who had been in specifically instructed not to talk to me about my racial identity, who'd been told essentially assimilate her, don't talk about race, it'll all be fine. By who, by who, by who? Okay, so like the judge who finalized my adoption, as an example, who my adoptive parents really did look to as an expert was literally the word he used was assimilate her. Um, they asked social workers that they worked with. They asked the adoption agency who did their home study. How, how you going to, all right, you can take this Korean baby, but don't you teach them none of that Korean stuff. My mother was like, I thought they'd at least recommend a book or something, and no one did. I mean, so they were doing what they were told, but of course they weren't prepared for the possibility that I'd encounter prejudice in our community. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, forgive me for a second. My Alabama brain is just trying to process everything you just said to me. Now, you, what you're saying is that they were t How do you legislate it? How, what <laughs> happens if they, they catch it eating some kimchi or some Korean barbecue? Do they take you back and reclaim you as a ward of the state? Like, how right, could they right. even? Not to get ahead of ourselves, but I just want to say, because because it, it needs to be said, and it's such an integral part of what a transracial adoption is, is that this country was founded on the premise of white people deciding what constitutes a family, when families can be made, how much they are worth, literally, when they can be torn apart 
or kept together. And so given that that is what this country is founded on, any kind of social construct, racism, sexism, misogyny, adoption, which is a process of taking somebody else's child, it's going to have remnants of that history. Okay, so then then let's talk a little bit about your experience, Rebecca, because you essentially came up in Oregon East, which I call New Hampshire. That's right. That's exactly (laughs) right. You know, now New Hampshire, you know, I've only gone there for the primaries, which is also very white as well. But what was that like for you? You know, how similar was your experience growing up, you know, over there on the East Coast? Very similar um, in that my family was quite loving um, and very, very idealistic artists, bohemian. But I would, the state was itself 99.1% white when I, when my family moved there with me. So I became the first black person in the town, Mm -hmm. um, as an infant and, you know, the only black kid through all of my, um, schooling and like Nicole, you know, started to experience, you know, it was sort of a, um, it was sort of a, a paradox, right? Because in my family, I was quite loved and quite, you know, I was a very outgoing child and I loved to dance and be creative and I, I was sort of a, a little bit of a star in my family. But then when I went outside of my family into schools and the real world outside of the bubble, you know, I was not prepared. I simply was not prepared. And and like, you know, Nicole's parents, although my my adoption was open and kind of a handshake deal, which ended up, as you can imagine, disastrously. Um, They were very well-meaning, but they just didn't think about it. They just didn't think about it. And that, again, is a real, you know, problem with language around adoption and the way that we talk about adoption. We're still using words like lucky and gift Mm -hmm. and grateful and gratitude and love is the only answer and all these kinds of things that we, we as adoptees know just isn't true. How did your family process racism when you came home and said, today the girl called my hair this, or they called me a black ass this, or I'm sure teachers were saying some slick stuff that they shouldn't have been saying to black kids at that time in a place like that. When you brought those issues home to your parents, how did they handle that? They didn't. They did not handle that. And actually, at a certain point, I stopped telling them mm-hmm. because they didn't, there was, you know, unintentional gaslighting, right? Are you sure that's what you heard? Are you sure he called you a nigger? Are you sure somebody tried to pet your hair? You know, and and I think that they, again, unintentional gaslighting. I think that, th- that for them, it was like, I can't imagine that, you know, nice, your our nice neighbors or or whomever, or even our teachers, would say something like that. And then even if they did, there was no language to process it, no no contextualization, no, all their, their reference point was Martin Luther yeah. King, as so many <laughs> white yeah. parents of black children at a certain Nicole, era. I see you, I see you jump, yeah. jump in there, Nicole. Like, yeah. like, how does that colorblind yeah. approach do a disservice um, to children that are in a transracial I mean- home? Yeah, I mean, if I could just answer your last question first, like like Rebecca, I didn't really talk about it at home. Like even at seven and eight, I knew, I just felt it really wouldn't be understood. I did once try to tell my family that I'd been made fun of for being adopted. You know, I didn't mention like the slurs, but I said, you know, this kid was like, your parents didn't want you. And like kind of their response was, well, everybody gets teased for something, right? And, Mm -hmm. you know, they gave me examples and I'm sure they were trying to empathize, they were. But um, what that conversation kind of told me at a young age was like, as well-meaning as they were, they expected these were gonna be safe environments for me because they were safe for them. And Mm -hmm. they thought there were few actual racists or bigots in our town because they were not among their targets ever. And so, you know, they're sending me to these places and expecting them to be like safe environments and supportive. And, you know, it wasn't the case. And I did not know how to shatter that illusion for them. I really didn't. Even at that age, I was like, it's my job here to like protect you in a way. Like you've always told me what really matters is the kind of people that we are. And I was learning slowly that that was not true to everybody. Right. But I didn't how was I supposed to educate adults in my life about that at the age of eight and nine? 
And so I do think it did me a disservice, but I will say, I don't think my adoptive family was especially warped, you know, by those experts, quote unquote experts, who told them to essentially ignore my racial identity either, because um, it did, it made these conversations a lot harder. We had them a lot later. Um, there could have been like a lot more openness and trust and um, just support. I think they loved me and they would have wanted to know how to better mm -hmm. support raising a child of color in our in our town. And the fact is like, they were kind of failed by that system too, even though the whole system as Rebecca was saying was essentially set up to cater to their needs as white adopters, they were still not well served by it. And I, I think about that a lot. So if these families aren't given the tools that they need and they also possess a blind spot to some of the horrors in the world because they just straight up haven't witnessed them or haven't had conversations about them, how much of a responsibility do adoptive families that are creating a transracial home, how much of a responsibility do they have to learning and educating and then trying to take down some of these systems of oppression? Or it's just being a good parent. Shouldn't that be enough? I adopted your ass. What the hell else you want me to do every day? Right. I mean, that's unfortunately very common. Uh, Lee, I hope they don't say case. it like that with an Alabama accent. But keep yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I really feel like if if your reference point is your only reference point for black folks is Martin Luther King, or if you don't have any black folks in your community or if you don't have any black art on your wall, you should not be raising black children who become black adults. And that's the other thing, right? Is that when we're, when we're little, it's like, you know, it, everybody's cute and everybody's, it's playtime and it's fun and it's so on and so forth. But when I got grown and came out into the world as a black woman, my parents didn't recognize me really. And they didn't mm. really know how to talk to me or how to interact with me and my child and my world. Um, so, you know, I feel very, very strongly that it cannot be intentional about good intentions. It has to be about a real commitment to community and culture in a way that is not, you know, exploitative or that feels like appropriation, but that's, mm -hmm. that's work. Right. And for the most part, which is why we have systemic racism, <laughs> is that it takes work. You got to get out of your self and your privilege and your power. Who wants to get out of their privilege and power? I mean, it's got to be it's got to feel great. Too much work. Yeah. I mean, you hear so much in adoption these days, especially and much more so than we were growing up, Rebecca, about like celebrating a child's birth culture, making sure they're connected to that. Um, and, you know, honestly, that I think of that, I call that the fun part, right? Because it, it, it is, it's something the family can do together. It feels very affirming. It is a lot harder to do what you're talking about, um, to really like center that child's experience, to really take a good hard look at your neighborhood, your community, the schools your kids will go to, maybe like the religious community that you're part of and ask yourself, what would it be like to be a child of color, a black child, an Asian child in this environment? Mm -hmm. I mean, it really needs to start from that very basic place. Um, and I think I think that's just the hard part. It's a real stumbling block for a lot of people because, I mean, again, like one of the things about being white in this country is if you don't want to think about race in a way, you don't have to. Um, the problem is it shouldn't become your child's burden to make that evident to you, you know. And so that's that's sort of something to consider. Like, I I really agree with a lot of what you're saying. Now, we talk about your relationship with with you and your parents and you and society, but what about your relationship with yourself? You know, when you come up as something, you're essentially both black swans to a degree within your environments, you know, as a child and as an adult, like, was there ever a time that you didn't feel black enough or Asian enough? Like once you got outside of the white Pleasantville bubbles that you were raised in and you went to that first family function out of town or you went to that one trip to the mall and you saw someone who looked like you walk me through those moments where you didn't feel like where you felt a legitimate disassociation with your own culture again it's like a it is like a a, a paradox or an oxymoronic feeling which is that every time i saw a black image easy reader on electric company my first dance teacher was black it was 
it was, I was drawn, mm -hmm. but I also, it was such a disconnect because I didn't have any sense of, of why I would belong to that person or that culture or that race. And I, and I do want to also say that no matter how, how much we reintegrate, you know, even as adults in college, you know, I founded the first black student union, you know, I found my people. I mean, being in black community has been so enormously important to me. As much as we try, those formative years were white. Those formative years centered the perception, the morals, the customs, everything white. I mean, I sat at a table, a, a, a dinner table, and everybody was white. I went to school and everybody was white. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like we've all had those experiences of, of not being enough or not being whatever it is, Asian enough or black enough or whatever, and really trying to grapple with that kind of grief because it is, it's a, it's a loss. But also having to reconcile with the fact that we were in our formative years raised by and within a white centered environment. It's interesting. I have one of the wildest questions actually that I get a lot as an adoptee author is like, so did you basically think that you were white for most of your life? And like the answer is no. Like I, think? <laughs> right? all I have to do is open my eyes. Right. I always knew. But because like Rebecca is saying, white was the default. It was like the world that I swam in. All I really understood was that, oh, I am like not like this. Like it's like I was defining myself in terms of a negative. I didn't know what mm -hmm. I was. I knew what I wasn't. Yeah. I knew I existed beyond the bounds of what was normal, accepted, like, okay, welcome um, in my community. And yeah, that definitely, it definitely left, um, you know, scars not to be dramatic that I think were hard to grapple with until, as you said, Roy, you sort of take your first steps out into the world, you see what the rest of the world is like, and then you're trying to reconcile like the distance between how you were raised and yeah. how the world is. And I think what's also interesting about your experience, Nicole, is that to a degree you had even less representation on television. I don't know how much you were allowed to watch TV and peruse the internet as a child, but like even the imagery of Asians on television was limited. There were, yeah. I would argue there were more black people on TV than Asians in varied roles. It wasn't as diverse as it is now. It wasn't mm -hmm. as boxed in stereotypically as it is now for black people. But I would imagine that to have been an issue as well. So it, yeah. We, we, we have to take a break, but let me ask you all this real quick. When you got older and you started making the realizations and the connections of, okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. I missed a lot of stuff about me growing up. How did you all, you know, I, in what ways have you tried to reconnect with your heritage over the years? You know, I know that there is a lot, Rebecca, that is lost because the base level foundation software was never installed on the desktop. But when you look back at your life, are there any milestones that really hit home for how you felt disconnected? And, you know, in, in what ways have you all tried to reconnect with your heritage? I mean, it's, it's definitely the work of a lifetime. I'll never feel like it's done. Uh, the biggest, most obvious way for me was when I became an adult and I was pregnant with my first child, I decided to search for my birth family. Um, so as I mentioned, they were Korean immigrants. They had just moved to this country like a year or two before I was born and adopted. So they were here. It was a long, convoluted, bureaucratic process to search for them. But I ended up finding them and reconnecting like the same month my child was born. So it's like weirder than fiction in that sense. And I, I wouldn't say it's been easy. Nothing about reunion or like open adoption, I think, is without its massive complications. But it was really important to me to be able to ask these questions I'd had for a lifetime and hear, like, just to think about what my life would have been like if I hadn't been adopted, if I'd grown up in this family, if I'd been raised in a Korean family. And I've, I've become really close to my biological sister who was raised in our, our Korean family. It's almost like seeing what like an alternate version of my life would have been like in a way. I've joked that I never feel less Korean than when I'm with my birth family because there's just so many things that they they know and I don't. But um, but it has been really important to me, obviously, to regain that little bit of connection and understand where I came from. Rebecca, how did you reconnect with your culture? Because, you know, BET only going to give you so much. 
<laughs> I um I leaned in. I mean, every opportunity I had um in terms of of you know, black student union, black student groups in college. Um after college I worked for uh I worked with the production company Blackside, which is known for Eyes on the Prize. I um you know, I, I, I leaned in my first five books are interviews with black writers and and um, public intellectuals. I just I, I inserted myself um, and took the hits because there were definitely hits of like, you, you're not black enough or what are you trying to do? Are you trying to um, I was trying to reintegrate. So so it was trial by fire a lot of a lot of the time. But I guess I would say the main thing is was giving birth to my kid and um, and seeing him now be as as black as he wants to be and it's you know i finally have that community and that's just it's mind-blowing and it's that is what i waited for you know when i when he was um when he was about four or five years old he saw a picture of me at four or five years old holding a frog and he said mommy why am i holding a frog and mm -hmm. there it was right yeah. that was the moment that i had been waiting for <laughs> Well, this is beautiful. After the break, I want to talk a little bit about your books that you wrote about these experiences, what inspired them, and some of the feedback slash backlash that you may have gotten from people from uh, writing these books. This is a wonderful conversation about transracial adoption. This is Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Let's talk a little bit about the books. Rebecca, I'll start with you. Now, your memoir, Surviving the White Gaze. Let's just start off the top. Why you choose that title? Why would would <laughs> were there um, other titles that, that, that what were some of the other white folks stop looking at me? What y'all staring at? <laughs> stop gosh. looking before I come over there. <laughs> the the there was never another title. Um, the the first time I heard Toni Morrison explain what the white gaze was, I was in my early twenties, and I was like, okay. That's it. That is what I have been grappling with my entire life. And I didn't have words for it. And I knew that I wanted the title to be ongoing, surviving, because I will be surviving the white gaze for my entire life. Um, but that white gaze, as we've talked about earlier, is the default. It is the lens through which the world uh, our world in America is established. It is it is the way that systems are built and the way that laws are made and the ways that, you know, decisions, on the spot decisions are made. It, all of it is the white gaze. And so it's very real for me for me to have survived it, not just within my upbringing, but in the society with which in which I live. You know, what's interesting about your upbringing, you know, because for me, I am to a large part, the polar opposite of you. You know, I came up in Birmingham City Schools, predominantly black school systems, black teachers. I never had more than one white classmate until high school. I did not meet my first Latino until the seventh grade. Black church, black community, blackity, black, black. And there are a lot of people in that regard that I know who, when I went to the black college, I went to Florida A&M, there were a lot of black people that I know who their first interactions in a corporate or employed capacity was after college with white people and taking in all of this new information and stimuli about what it's like to be seen and perceived a certain way. In an odd way, I feel like your upbringing, Rebecca, because it was from day one, just white that you are hyper qualified to speak because you understand what it's like for adolescents to look at you versus an adult in a C-suite or somebody who's being passive aggressive. And, you know, we talk about um, passive aggressive workplace harassment as well. So how much did that upbringing help you write this book? You know, as as uncomfortable as that was, how much of an education on whiteness did you get from your childhood? <laughs> I'm very conversant in white people. I'm very, uh, I am very well poised um, to be a white person whisperer, uh, although I declined that offer uh, time and time again. I think a lot about that. And 
um, the the numerous times that I've experienced micro and macro aggression, racism in the workplace. And one which was so egregious that I um, went to a lawyer and explained the situation. And she said to me, you definitely have a case of racial discrimination. And my feeling was not victory. There's no victory in being right about racism. And so in the same way that I can be conversant in white spaces, it's not really, it doesn't really feel great. So Nicole, your book, All You Can Ever Know, walk me through the day that you sat and you decided, yeah, you know what? What I went through wasn't cool. I don't know what the solutions are completely, but we have to talk about where we are at least today with this issue. What inspired the book? And also talk to us a little bit about the response you got when the sure. book came out. Um, I'll say that like the book was not the first time I'd written about adoption. I still remember the very first like piece I ever wrote about it. It was never published. I wrote it like years ago. I showed it to like three people. I stuck it in a drawer. It was terrifying to me to be, it wasn't even just the vulnerability. It was facing this like wall of, of half truths and of comforting things that I told myself and that other people had told me for a lifetime. So writing about adoption did not come easily to me. And I sort of practiced for years before the book happened. Because you had to undo your own, the own, I don't want to say wall of lies, but the comforts that you had built up for yourself about your existence within that system. Just the disclaimers, right? Like the whole, let me reassure you that my family loved me. Let me reassure you that like I was basically like a happy, like well-adjusted child. I don't even know if that's true by the way, right? But like that's, <laughs> it was like, these are things, they're, they're the weight of expectations on adoptees starting as children is something that I don't think we talk about enough. Like from a very young age, especially if you're a different race than your parents, people notice, people ask questions and like sort of lurking behind some of the questions apart from nosiness is like, are you okay? Like, are you really okay? Is your family okay? Um, you know, just tell me all about this because I don't understand, especially maybe growing up in a super white area like like Rebecca and I both did. So I, I was like this spokesperson for adoption from childhood that I never asked to be, but was always telling this story. And so, yeah, to try to like reclaim that story, to tell a different, much more complicated version of it, you know, one that doesn't shy away from talking about race and the impact of racial isolation. That was a scary thing for me. And I don't know that I was worried about being attacked for it or backlash, because I know you want to talk about that. I was just like, I've been telling myself this comforting story. I've been telling other people this comforting story, like actually, going deeper into the truth, it was actually very difficult. But I wanted to because I had started to see and honestly was inspired by lots of other adoptees within the community, like sharing their stories. I knew the truth was more complicated. I knew there were feelings and questions and like racism that I'd been grappling with for a lifetime. And I, I just wanted there to be like more stories. I'm always going to want more adoptee stories and understanding my adoptee story and the fact that I don't have to choose between being Korean and an adoptee, like I am both, um, those are very, very important to me and very affirming. So that was kind of where the story came from. Did, did your family, well, Nicole, first to you and then to Rebecca, did your families read your books? Yes, so my adoptive parents, my birth father and my biological sister all read the book before. Did they published. read it or did one person read it and then gossip to the others and get it all wrong in a terrible game of telephone. Like that one time I talked about my daddy on a podcast and then everybody was checking me about talking about, yeah. sorry, I'm bringing up personal stuff. Rebecca, what oh. about your family? Did yeah. your family? <laughs> it was more like that. Um, I sent a galley to my mom and she read it and said it was a gift and then told my dad my about some of the things I'd written in it. And he felt uh, that it was an affront and so she changed her mind about it. And my siblings, who are their biological children, for the most part, have been protective of, of them. So it, it has not gone well. Okay. So how much... Well, I guess it didn't matter if you were even taking that into account when you wrote the book, how your family might react to it. But what about the regular real world uh, reactions to it? Was it as harsh as, you know, some of the people in your family? No. And let me also add that 
I waited a very, very long time. I am not a young gal. <laughs> I waited a very long time to write this book. And, it, and, it, and I was seized by a moment to write this book, which was when Mike Brown was shot and my son, who was seven or eight years old, asked if we were going to get shot. And I suddenly was so enraged by the way in which I had not been protected, by the way in which I had not been given tools to be a black parent, the way that I had to figure this out with my child and protect my child. Um, so I, I wrote it in part for them, right? Wouldn't you like to know what it was like for your black family member to grow up in this white family and have these experiences? Not the case. That said, the response from the adoption community, adoptees, transracial adoptees, I'm sure Nicole has had some, has been ferociously, I mean, just so hungry for this, mm -hmm. for stories about transracial adoptees and representation. And that has been, I mean, just deeply, deeply moving and, and so critically important and, and makes up to some degree for, for the the rift with my family um but you know it that's also just dealing day in day out as a black woman on in these streets you know so it's there have been there have been some some less than kind things said uh it's a you know it's like a double helix it's like you're an adoptee and you're not being grateful and you're a black woman and you're being too loud now nicole's already mentioned this to us but rebecca to the whole mike brown point and we talk about trying to have a base of knowledge to pull from, to to be a vessel to pour into our, our children. Why was it important for you to find out who your biological parents were? Did you, here's a better question. Did it go the way you thought it was going to go? You know, in no. terms of that journey. What no. did you expect and how did it, and how did it play out? Well, it's two parts. I didn't really have time to expect with my birth mother because I was 11 when I'm reunited with her, which was way too early. Um, and I was um, deeply emotionally manipulated by her. She's white um, and uh, has a lot of, has a lot of caring qualities, but also a lot of um, appropriation, black appropriation license uh, that she takes and has taken. We are estranged. Um, I met my birth father when I was in my early 20s, and it was very, very um, overwhelming. His story was that I had been taken. He didn't have any say in the matter. He wanted me. He had grown up himself in um, in orphanages and, and foster system. Um, and so he felt, you know, like I feel about my kid, my kid. It's like, oh, I have black family now. I would like to keep you. But his claim is that, you know, my white birth mother and her family cut him out because he's black. Did the question of why didn't you fight for me ever come up? And forgive me yes. if I'm if I'm no no going absolutely. Places he was, you know, he didn't really have the tools to fight. You know, he wasn't um, he was not gainfully employed. Um, he was all by himself. He didn't have any squad or family. And my white birth mother and her family were quite able <laughs> to to cut him out of the picture. Either with money or through the courts and being a black man and going against a white woman. And... Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, after the break, I want to dive into the way adoption is portrayed in Hollywood. I'm very curious to get y'all thoughts on that because as far as I can tell with adoption like it's like it's like different strokes or them adopted kids gonna murder you don't you <laughs> yep. don't you bring home that weird child that child that's you stand about, that's out the about window up. <laughs> <laughs> these murder babies <laughs> we'll talk about that and also some solutions that families that are either thinking or have already created transracial homes can do I uh, can't wait to hear that advice about that this is beyond the scenes we'll be right back Beyond the scenes, we are talking transracial adoption and two wonderful authors have been ushering us through their experience, the cause and effects, the positives and negatives of this. And now we need to talk about, you know, the fact that you all wrote these books, which means that you also avoid 
in the literary system where people are not being properly educated about the issues that you've faced your entire lives. When the truth is that more often than not, we just regular folks, we get our we get our education from TV and movies. You know, like I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell you what I know about adoption. I know different strokes. I know if a white man comes save you. Now, you know what's hilarious in the different strokes intro? The white dude is riding around the hood and he sees the two dudes shooting basketball and he just goes, get in the limo. <laughs> get in the limo. He just snatches them right up. Yep. Yeah, no paperwork, no nothing. Just come get you a black kid. What do y'all think about the way media and pop culture portray adoption and what's missing from the mainstream conversation around adoption? I think so often um, the portrayal of adoption is like when they have it, they use it as a, as a plot point. It's usually like a, an obvious point of conflict and it's going to end with someone saying, but you're my real family and that's what matters. Or like <laughs> my real parents are the ones who raised me and that's like it. Like that's how like the episode of whatever growing pains or whatever sitcom I remember watching as a kid, that's, that was the resolution yeah. of the adopted kids storyline. And I think like it's starting maybe to move away from that a little bit, but there is still media, and I think media portrayals are are partly responsible for the fact that, yeah, what what everyday people without connection to adoption know about it is, is basically that you're you're happy and grateful, right? And your family is your real family, and you don't feel confused about that, right? And I don't think people realize the pressures that that creates. One of the things that I really admire um, about Nicole uh, and and her work and approach to the issue, and what what I try to emulate as well, is that you know, we're bigger than our adoption stories. Mm -hmm. We actually are much more um, nuanced and multifaceted. So there's a million stories in our adoption stories. I, and I think that the what happens in, in film and television or in whatever representation is that it is, it's, it's, it's one note. It's very boring and, and predictable. And it's not just that, that it, that it lacks nuance, but then the conversations around it mm -hmm lack nuance. And so I feel like we have to be willing to not just create stories of representation, but to talk about them with transracial adoptees. I mean, that's the whole thing is that for the most part, adoption and trans transracial adoption, we hear from we hear from the social workers, the white social workers, the white parents, mm -hmm. you know, the the people who are facilitating these adoptions and not the adoptees. We right. are the experts period, full stop. You know, there's a difference too between it being like a story that Hollywood wants to tell, like a great story and it being someone's lived experience. And so, yeah, right. I would agree. Like um, if you're making adoption media, like you should have adoptees in the room. If it's about transracial adoption, you should have transracial adoptees in the room. Not because we're a monolith, not because we all have the same experiences, but because Rebecca's right, we're we're the experts on that. And then, you know, either either it's often like a very you know, that sort of one note portrayal of it's fine, everything's fine, it's not complicated, or they go completely the other direction and it's something sensationalistic. Like, um, you know, you were joking before the break, Roy, but like, I think about the number of times an adopted person comes back to like murder their parents in Agatha Christie adaptations. And like, you know, it's always... It's, it's just, it's like either we're suspect, or can't quite be trusted, have all this baggage, or like it's completely fine and like it, the adoption doesn't matter and there isn't enough middle ground. I did not know that about Agatha Christie. I don't think she wrote them that way. I would have to go back and like check, but like some <laughs> of the adaptations update things and yeah, they'll have someone's like, you know, child that they gave, they gave up or gave away or abandoned, like come back and like be murderous and like, okay, you know, that's, that's one take. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a choice. That's a choice. What's interesting is that at both polar ends of the portrayal of the adopted child, the parent is still the hero because they didn't deserve to be murdered or was, <laughs> look at this good thing I did. And and the and and it's right. the foster care system. And it's like they I went into the foster care and they were fighting in the hallway and I pulled you out of that and and I brushed your hair and I gave you a haircut. Now look at you. You was a good, acceptable Negro to be in society. Except Why you didn't brush my hair. <laughs> my that. parents? Except you didn't. No. No one had told my parents about Asian baby hair. And, you know, they kept trying to make it life lap for like the first two years of my life. It was just like, whoa. I know. I'm like, nope, it just is going to stick straight up. Sorry. 
Mm-hmm. So then to that point, Rebecca, when we talk about the story and the portrayal of the adoptee never being told, what are some of the challenges that adoptees face, especially when we talk about mental health? Because at some point, I would imagine there's issues of abandonment and like, why is that never seeded into the conversation? And, and just, and if you all want, it, it, talk a little bit about your own mental health struggles over the years and why you think that's not as big a part of the conversation around adoption. I will say that abandonment is our, I will speak for myself, but I would, is the central trauma of adoptees. Um, it, there, it, there is what's called a primal severance, right? There's, there's no way around that. We are separated from the person who, whose body we came out of. I mean, that's there's grief around that. I don't think our society is great at talking about mental health in general. So like, you know, let's acknowledge that up front. And I think, um, I, I feel this as a parent too. Sometimes you're like, well, I do have like, I wanna make sure you're okay. Like thinking about you and making sure that you're okay is the thing that consumes me 24 seven as a parent. But like, in a way you don't know what you don't know. And you're trying to gauge a lot based on like, like offhand comments, like things you overhear. Um, I think my parents didn't know I was really struggling and I don't think they knew the reason because again, I was not telling them that I was like hearing slurs at school. But like when I was about eight or nine, I started twisting and twirling my hair, um, like a nervous tick. And um, like I developed like a small bald spot and that was like their signal. We don't know what's wrong, but like something is clearly wrong. Um, And I started seeing a therapist, um, like a sort of, she specialized in play and art therapy when I was really young. I mean, I will say I give them credit for realizing that like I needed more help and support. There were things I was not voicing to them that I had to talk about with somebody. But I mean, for all that, I know I talked to the therapist. I know she talked to my parents. My parents and I, for all the love and support, like we still didn't talk to each other about these things. We didn't talk about it till I was an adult. And it wasn't just being adopted and it wasn't just being Korean. It was like a, it was a combination of a lot of different things, you know, that led to that, that moment where they could tell I needed help. But, um, you know, that's just something I've been living with. And I, I'm sure some of it was like, like Rebecca was saying, like um, abandonment as kind of like that, that first central trauma for a lot of adoptees. Yeah. And then just the impacts again of growing up and like seeing no one who looks like you and then experiencing racism and while being told race doesn't matter. I mean, how do you square those things as a child? It's just kind of something that started pretty early. So my story is further complicated by the fact that I did reunite with my birth mother at a very young age. She is white and problematic. We had a very intense relationship and bond. All I wanted to speak to the central trauma of abandonment was her love and her to regain her shine and her attention. Um, and uh, and she had a very bizarre relationship with blackness. Um, and here I am trying to figure out my blackness. And so at a certain point, she wrote her own book and I agreed to help her promote it because that of course is a great package. This was many, 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 many years ago. After, after we went on, I think it was Good Morning America. I read about this in the book. And I was talking with Joan London, you may remember, oh, yes. uh, about being a, a black a, a black woman and, and how it's it's really important as a black adoptee to to use my voice to to help, you know, amplify and clarify my experience and what what might be a, a similar experience for others. And afterwards, my birth mother and I went to lunch and she said, um, you know, I heard you say something today on the show. And I really thought because of our dynamic, I thought she was going to say that I was hogging the airtime, that I was speaking too much, that I was taking away from her shine. She said, I heard you call yourself black. She said, you came out of my body. You can't just go around calling yourself black. And that was a moment that tipped the scale for me. And I came home that night and I was living with uh, my best girlfriend who is, you know, chosen family um, to this day. And, uh, and I just felt, I don't, I wouldn't say suicidal ideation, but I did also, I did feel like I don't want to do this. I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to have this experience. It's too much. And she encouraged me to see a, um, a psychotherapist or therapist. And, and I, and I just sort of ran down this list of things that I had gone through, including this comment from my birth mother. And she was like, okay, you're clinically depressed and you need to be on medication right now. 
Um, and that was really, that was really both a relief and also kind of alarming because I had been living with all of this, this sort of melange of, of abandonment and, you know, racial identity and security and trying to just navigate this white world consistently and constantly. Um, so yeah, that, that was definitely a moment. To the mental health part of this, right? How much of a role does the state and the adoption agencies and all of the foster homes play in educating the families? Hey, look, you, you getting the kid, but you need to be prepared to help this child through a lot of stuff because as they mature, they're going to make realizations about themselves and they're going to need some help. How much is the toll on an adoptee's mental health also ignored by the state and the adoption agencies themselves? And what role do they have in preparing the parents for what the hell is going to be happening when they create a transracial home? I mean, I think the problem with that is really that even in the best case scenario of an adoption agency telling adoptive parents, you need to be prepared, you need to know how to do the hair, you need to do this, you need to do that. White parents, depending upon where they choose to live, what their, you know, what their personalities are, where, what their own backgrounds are, or how, what their, you know, sort of um, uh, values are, it, it's really easy to not do the things that they're told to do. You know, I think even if my and in fact, somebody did say to my mom when I was younger, you should you should find someone to help her with her hair. She was like, it's, it's fine. You know, I mean. Because to her, it was fine. And for me, it was until it wasn't. Yeah. Why is this Korean baby hair sticking straight up? Yeah, let's just cut it down. <laughs> just put some put some VO. What was that? That VO5? <laughs> I have no idea. Put some hot oil treatment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even in the best case scenario where you have an adoption agency that's trying to really educate prospective adopters um, about um, like trauma informed parenting and like where a lot of because let's not forget a lot of adopted kids are coming from really hard places. Um, you know, I was adopted like straight out of state care at the age of two and a half months. Um, and so I didn't spend like a long time in like an institution or in foster care. And like all these things can really obviously like affect kids for a long time. I know there is like required education training. There's often not a lot of post-adoption support for families uh, or for birth parents. And that's huge. You know, and ultimately, like, let's not forget adoptees, we are not the the clients. We are not really the people the whole system set up to serve. Like we are babies or children and people are making decisions for us, even if they're doing that in the hope of acting in our best interest. Like it's adults making decisions. It's adults being served. Um, it's often like, you know, adopters needs that are being kind of centered in all this. And so yeah, if a white family doesn't know like what questions to ask even or what support to ask for, that's going to be yet another barrier to them and ultimately their children getting the support that they need. And we know from studies that a lot of white parents aren't comfortable talking about like race with their with their kids. And so I, I don't know, it's like it's like people don't think there is a, a problem. And so they're not asking for the help that they or their kids might need. I think also the way that it has been celebritized. Uh, and the relationships that we see, you know, with with um, celebrities, white celebrities adopting black children and having this kind of um, image of isn't this wonderful? And it really, it, you know, it see hey there guys, is representation. Look at my black baby I bought. It's really for us. <laughs> it's it's really cringy. But I think for for most white folks. It's like, oh, that's really great. And again, it's it's really easy. I mean, I, I have talked with and met with many, many white adoptive parents, celebrity and otherwise, who listen intently, you know, about, mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, I'll do this and I, I need to do this. And oh, great. Okay. It's more than, more than a Serena Williams poster and take all these notes, right? And then don't actually do any of those things and or start doing them, like start trying to collect black friends, try to collect black community. And black folks are like, you know, you should have done that first. I'm not trying to be your black friend for your black child. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, the funny thing is, is that we talk so much about good intentions, 
but the intentionality is not there. If that makes sense. Do you ever, Rebecca, do you ever feel like, um, you know, people want you to give them like a list, like literally tell me the five things I have to do. Oh, no, no, and if no. I do those five things, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> that um, was my totally. last question. Oh, no. Totally. <laughs> You're going to have to do a different one. Sorry. <laughs> no, you've already kind of answered it. Like what, what advice, is, or is there not a checklist? You know, if I'm considering adopting a transracial child, you know, what, what, what do I do? Because if... If it's not your job to help me tear down the oppressive system and I'm the white parent and you won't help me be my black child's friend, how do I get black friends for my black child? If the solution is not bringing them around white people until they're a senior in high school, like what, mm -hmm. how, what, what are the hurdles for potential transracial adopt, adopters? I just, I feel... I feel like there has to be, just as like a come to Jesus moment, really. Like it, it, you, you. If so there's you're not a, a white, specific checklist. There, there's not a way to. Just I mean, go, there this, is. This I've I've been asked and I've given them many, many times. I don't think that is the answer necessarily. Right. Although I think that those things are good to keep in mind. Um, but I think that it's really: Are you willing to decenter whiteness? You have a black or 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 Asian Korean different race child in your house. That means that 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 race needs to be reflected as much, if not more, than y'all's taste and priorities. I mean, I will still meet a lot of people who want um, the basic story of transracial adoption to be comforting and simple and like kind of a savior story. I, I remember being told many times by many different people, it's like proof that love is really enough. It like is an antidote to racism. Like it's just, it's incredible. Like the, I mean, again, I talk about this a lot, but the pressures that people will put on adoption and adoptees, um, there's so many things. And I think we've talked about some of them already. Like you need to, before you adopt, not after and not when your kid is 10 or 16, but before you even take the step, you need to start really taking a hard look at your, your community. Like what is the yep. world and the life that this child, what, what are you bringing them into? And I don't say that to say like, and then you should decide that you're terrible and not adopt, but like you need to be able to be, <laughs> and if it's uncomfortable, good. If it takes work, good. If there's stuff you have to do first to be ready to adopt, like that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, we prepare as biological parents, we prepare in lots of different ways, right. To have a family. So if you want to be a parent through adoption and particularly to a child of another race than you, like these are just the questions and like the, you have the interrogation that you should be able to do because you need to center that child in their experience and what their life is going to be like and not think about like, you are no longer just experiencing the place you live or your neighborhood through like your own experience. Um, another thing I, th I think is really important is that um, this, you know, this is kind of separate from the race, but it's related. Um, is that I don't think adoptees should ever be made to feel as though like they have to choose one family over another. And this comes up in lots of ways. Like I've talked to so many adoptees who feel like we have to um, almost tamp down both our questions about our racial identities, cultural identities, and also like our questions about our birth families if we're not in contact with them. Um, sort of like to protect the feelings or the integrity of the adoptive family. And I think you know, if there's one big important message I think people should understand about adoption is that like both families are real. I mean, we're all real humans and um, adoptees shouldn't be made to feel as though they all, always have to kind of like pick one family or only belong to one family or only think about or love one family versus the other. Um, I think if that had been stressed more in my life, that would have been, it would have made certain things easier for me. Maybe not the racial component, but other things. I would say also the the last thing I would say about um, adoptive parent potential adoption uh, adoptive parents is do not recreate or create a microcosm of the worst dynamic of racism in America, which is to say we're the only one in the room, we're we're the last person who is considered. Ooh. Do you know what I'm saying? Do not yeah. create a microcosm of what we already see in the world, in, our, in, the, in this country, in the worst racial dynamic possible. Well, 
this has been an amazing conversation and I cannot thank you both for, you know, just sharing your journey, sharing your traumas with the world and the effort to help bring some understanding. I cannot thank you all enough. Nicole, Rebecca, thank you for going beyond the scenes with me. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Roy and Rebecca. Be sure to look in the episode description for a link to watch Nicole and Rebecca's original interviews with Trevor. Play my theme music. <laughs>